Welcome to the last couple of sessions, and now Nima is going to tell us about completely locked volcano in this So, hi everyone. Uh, so, I know this is uh, the evening or the afternoon on a Friday, and uh, you're all tired of the workshop, so I'm going to keep it very light, at least for the first half of the lecture. Um, we'll go into more details in the second half. Um, so the goal of this lecture is to introduce uh, this generalization of real stable polynomials called uh, completely locked concave polynomials. Uh, so, oops. so, uh, so uh, the best way I, I try to think of uh, these completely locked concave polynomials is as generating polynomials of distributions. Okay. So when we are talking about distributions, uh, there are generally two kinds of flavors of distributions. There are continuous distributions and discrete distributions. For the purposes of this talk, uh, uh, we are going to think of them as density or unnormalized density functions on uh, Rn in the case of the continuous distributions and on the integer lattice in the case of discrete distributions. Um, so uh, to, to just keep things simple, you, you can also think of just discrete distributions on the vertices of the hypercube, which you can also think of as distributions on subsets of 1 through n. Okay. So uh, vertices of hypercube are basically the indicator vectors of sets. So, uh, so there, are, there are generally three algorithmic things we want to do with distributions. Uh, the obvious one is to sample from them. So you have an unnormalized density given by an oracle, and you want to produce a sample from it. Uh, very related to sampling is uh, uh, computing the partition function. Uh, so in the case of uh, continuous distributions, that's like integrating the function over the entire space. So that's what you have to normalize your uh, distribution by to get a probability distribution. And uh, there are very general uh, reductions between these two. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about optimization. And by that, I mean finding the mode of this distribution. Okay. Um, so, uh, so in the continuous world, there is a large class of functions for which all of these three operations uh, are basically, we are able to do them using efficient algorithms. And that's the class of log concave distributions. Okay. So a log concave distribution is just uh, a density function, which when composed with log is a concave function. Okay. Or equivalently, uh, you have this uh, inequality on the bottom. So, uh, so it's one of the one of the beautiful results in computer science that you can, uh, more or less, with minimal assumptions, uh, efficiently produce a sample from a log concave distribution just using an oracle function. Okay. Uh, and uh, these are basically all based on uh, Mon uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods that uh, start from some point and then. Uh, walk on this space uh, and converge to the distribution represented by this function. Okay. So uh, if you want to optimize such a function or find the mode of a distribution like this, uh, it's, you can also do this efficiently because finding the mode is equivalent to finding the maximum of the log of this distribution. And that's just a concave function. So you can do this by convex programming methods. Okay. So all right. Uh, OK, and we also know uh, a lot of examples in the continuous world of uh, log concave distributions. My favorite one is the indicator of a convex set. So this is a density that uh, sends the interior of a convex set to 1 and the exterior to 0. So you can just easily verify that it satisfies the log concavity. Uh, there are other things like the Gaussian density, and there are operations you can, uh, uh, you can perform on log concave distributions that preserve log concavity. So uh, for example, conditioning on a coordinate or uh, projecting onto a coordinate, uh, all of these operations preserve log concavity. So, so the purpose of this talk is to find an analogous class in the discrete distributions. Okay. Um, so still, we want to be able to, uh, to do these things more or less efficiently, sampling, counting, and optimization. <coughs> so, so we want to basically complete this picture. So uh, on the top, I've, I've represented the distributions, which we also think of as uh, density functions. So there are continuous densities and discrete densities. Uh, we also want the analogy to work for the support functions or the support sets of the distributions. Okay? So in the continuous world, 
uh, when you have a lock concave uh, function, uh, its support is always a convex set, and the reverse is also true. If you have a convex set, there is a, there is a lock concave distribution whose support is that convex set. That's just the indicator of that convex set. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to argue that uh, the analog of convex sets should be matroids or matroid-like objects. And then I'll tell you what the, what the weighted version or what the densities should look like. Any, any questions so far? So if you want to talk about uh, lock concave uh, discrete distributions, perhaps the first thing that you might think of is uh, why not just uh, restrict the, the lock concavity inequalities to just the lattice, okay? So you have a function on, on z to the n, uh, and if this function was on the entire Rn, lock concavity would have meant lock concavity would have meant that you have inequalities of this form. That uh, the value of your distribution at any convex combination is uh, lower bounded by the corresponding geometric convex combination of the points. Okay, and uh, this is still a valid inequality if the convex. Uh, you can still talk about this sort of inequality on uh, on functions whose domain is the integer lattice as long as the convex combination on the right-hand side is an integer point. So you take integer points, you uh, combine them. Uh, as long as you get an integer point, you, you, you can just impose this as an inequality on your set. Okay. So the first proposal might be, OK, let's, let's talk about uh, discrete functions that, that, uh, that basically satisfy all inequalities of this form. Okay. And that's a very well-studied property when you're talking about uh, uh, functions on the, on the one-dimensional integer lattice, okay? So on the one-dimensional integer lattice, functions are basically sequences, right? And uh, this condition reduces to a local condition called lock concavity. Uh, so you have a sequence represented by this function, and then uh, all of those inequalities reduce to uh, local inequalities of this form, that for every three consecutive members in your, uh, in your sequence, the uh, middle one squared should be bigger than the product of the first and the third. So, uh, so, so first of all, uh, this, uh, this lock concavity of sequences is a very uh, well-studied and well-recognized property, especially in combinatorics. There are many uh, sequences in combinatorics associated to uh, combinatorial objects that turn out to be lock concave. Uh, so Alistair talked a, li a little bit about uh, matchings of different sizes in graphs. Uh, so uh, uh, Juni Ha, uh, 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 proved that uh, the coefficients of the chromatic polynomial, which we have also uh, talked a lot about uh, in, this, uh, in this workshop, uh, the coefficients of this polynomial also turn out to be uh, a lock concave sequence, and there are many, many more examples. Okay? But the problem with this definition is really when you go to higher dimensions. Okay? Uh, so if you think of any function that's just supported on the vertices of the hypercube, it's going to automatically satisfy all of these inequalities. Okay? That's because no vertex of the hypercube is a convex combination of the other ones. So these are just not telling you anything. Okay? And certainly, we don't, expect to, we don't expect a class as large as all functions on the hypercube to be algorithmically tractable. Okay? So, so let me just uh, mention that these uh, lock concave sequences in the one-dimensional case, uh, it's been observed by many groups of people that uh, they, they sort of indicate shadows of something called Hodge theory, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the second, uh, a little bit in the second part of this lecture. Uh, so, so here are some other uh, uh, sequences of lock, con uh, here are some other uh, lock concave sequences. If you think of uh, two convex sets and look at the mixed volumes of them. So you, uh, you take the mixed volume of, uh, uh, k and L uh, with different numbers of k and L repeated in the sequence. Okay. Uh, so as you vary kappa, uh, you get a sequence, and this sequence turns out to be lock concave. And the Hodge theory or the shadow of Hodge theory associated with this lock concave sequence uh, is the so called polytope algebra, which again I'm going to talk a little bit about in the second part. Uh, so uh, Rota's conjecture, or the coefficients of a generalization of the chromatic polynomial of graphs. Uh, uh, this is another sequence that has been uh, proved to be lock concave by Adiprosito, Hohan, Katz. Uh, this turns out to be related to a Hodge theory for matroids. 
And then uh, there are other things. Uh, let me just skip them in the interest of time. Okay. So this lock concavity of sequences, it, it works very well for one dimensional cases, but when you go to higher dimensions, it doesn't really tell you anything. So uh, can we maybe perhaps uh, strengthen the, the lock concavity condition and get something that generalizes to higher dimensions? Okay. So, uh, so here, is, here is an approach. Um, uh, so Newton basically knew a set of inequalities that we now know by uh, Newton's inequalities. Uh, he knew that if you have a sequence of numbers and you put them as the coefficients of a real rooted as a as the coefficients of a polynomial, if the polynomial turns out to be real rooted, then the the coefficients are are log concave. Okay. Uh, moreover, the coefficients divided by the binomial uh, coefficients are also log concave. So this is slightly stronger than simple log concavity. This is called ultra log concavity. So this is what Newton knew uh, in his time. And uh, fortunately, real rootedness is something that you can generalize to higher dimensions. And we've already uh, talked about it in this uh, boot camp. Uh, um, so the analog of real rooted polynomials in higher, in, uh, uh, in basically multivariate polynomials are real stable polynomials. So let's, let's do this cleanly. Uh, so uh, when you're talking about the high dimensional uh, distribution on the integer lattice, you can associate a generating polynomial to it the same way you did to, uh, 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 to one dimensional uh, sequences. So what you do is you basically take, the, take your distribution and put them as the coefficients of a multivariate polynomial. Okay. So to each integer point, uh, you, can, uh, you can associate a, a monomial uh, where, the, where the coordinates of the integer point appear as the powers. Uh, so you just multiply that by the value of your distribution at the point and then sum this over all points. Okay. So this is a very important definition. Uh, please ask questions if something is not clear. Okay. So then... Generating polynomial may not be a polynomial. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so for the purposes of this talk, we are only talking about uh, finite support uh, distributions. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, all right, so, uh, so, so Newton's inequalities basically tell you that if this associated polynomial has real roots uh, in the one dimensional case, then uh, the, the corresponding uh, distribution is log concave according to the previous definition. Okay. So of course, uh, we've already talked about distributions whose, uh, whose multivariate polynomials are uh, satisfy real stability, which is the correct generalization of real rootedness. Um, so Borchia, Brandon, and Leggett were the first ones to study these kinds of distributions, and they named them strongly Riley distributions. Um, so so uh, you call a distribution on the hypercube strongly Riley exactly when its <laughs> associated polynomial is real stable. And uh, there are many examples of these strongly related distributions. Uh, um, I think Shayan has already talked about uh, some of them, but just let me remind you of a few. Uh, so, uh, so in the in the uh, univariate case, uh, the binomial distribution, the the outcome of n uh, coin tosses, uh, the number of heads you see in n coin tosses. Uh, so that's a distribution whose polynomial is uh, real rooted, and that's because you can you can factorize the associated generating polynomial in this way. So binomial distributions are are ba are basically the uh, the most general uh, things that you can see in the univariate uh, case. Uh, if you allow for um, uh, for coin tosses to have uh, different biases. Okay. So another example is spanning trees in a graph. Uh, so you have a graph uh, on m edges, and then you uh, you map subsets of edges uh, that correspond to a spanning tree to one, and then the other subsets to zero. So that's still a multivariate function, and it turns out that the associated polynomial of it uh, is real stable. Okay. Um, so so uh, so the terminantal point processes are basically the main example of these strong related distributions, and uh, I know that you've already talked about them, but let me just again remind you. Uh, so you have uh, so you have a PSD matrix, uh, and then you associate to a subset of one through n uh, uh, the value, the determinant of the corresponding principal subminor. Okay. 
So if you have a PST matrix, all of these uh, principal miners uh, are also PST, and therefore they have a positive determinant. So this is a positive density on subsets of 1 through n. And it turns out that the associated polynomial is uh, real rooted, and that's really under the hood because uh, you can write the generating polynomial as a determinant. And uh, real rootedness basically uh, uh, boils down to the fact that symmetric matrices have real roots, have real eigenvalues. All right, uh, so, okay, so we have this class of stronger ideal distributions. Uh, it, it seems like it, it might be a generalization of, or it might be an analog of log concavity in the discrete case. Uh, so can we do the algorithmic things that we wanna do uh, on, on this class? Turns out that the answer is yes, okay? So, so there are local Markov chains that mix in polynomial time. Uh, so these only need an oracle for, for your distribution. So you, uh, 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 this, this will be talked about more uh, during the semester. Uh, turns out that you can also do optimization up to a certain degree. Okay. So there are algorithms to find an approximation of the max of your distribution. Uh, the sort of approximation that you should expect is of this form, uh, two to the degree of your polynomial. Okay. And uh, so this is, this is uh, slightly deviating from the continuous world. In the continuous world, you can find the exact maximum. Uh, here you can't uh, because there are uh, uh, basically matching uh, hardness of approximation results. Uh, but still, this sort of approximation is interesting and I'll talk more about it. Okay. So, okay, so sampling implies that you can also do counting, uh, but what about deterministic counting? Uh, so Gurbitz, uh, uh, whose inequalities I think Shayan talked about and maybe even in other talks, <laughs> um, basically uh, came up with a very beautiful idea uh, that when you have a real stable uh, polynomial or a strong value distribution, you can approximate its coefficients as long as you have an oracle access to, uh, to something that evaluates the polynomial for you. Okay. So the sort of approximation you can see is still exponential, similar to the optimization case. Uh, 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 and uh, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about uh, where this sort of uh, exponential is coming from. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you go slightly beyond this exponential, you get one plus epsilon. Uh, and that's sort of like a reason why uh, in all of these cases, you, you either see an exact algorithm, a one plus epsilon approximation, or you see an, uh, an exponential approximation. Okay. So there are generalizations of this uh, when you want to find the maximum of the product of two things, but let me just skip that. Okay, so we have this uh, class of strongly Riley distributions, and we can do these algorithmic tasks for it uh, efficiently. Uh, but the question is, is it too restrictive? Okay. So, so determinantal distributions are sometimes called the, the mother of all strong regularity distributions. Uh, and that's because in most applications, uh, you always start from something determinantal and then you apply maybe a few operations to it and you get the strong regularity distribution that you care about. There probably are things that are non-determinantal but are strong regularity, but, but in most applications, uh, everything starts from something determinantal. And uh, if we really care about matroids, which we remember we want it uh, to be the support of our functions, uh, strong Riley is not the correct answer, okay? So, so one, in one direction, matroids are the correct answer. Uh, so there is this result of Koei, Oxley, Sokel, and Wagner who showed that the supports of strong Riley distributions are matroids. So, so supports are matroids always. But the reverse is not true. Brandon showed that there are matroids whose support, uh, which cannot be the support of any strong variety distribution. Okay. So it's easy to construct matroids where the uniform distribution is not strong variety, but this is something stronger. No weighted distribution can have uh, uh, the property of being strong variety. So, all right, so the main insight uh, for, for generating a larger class whose supports are all matroids is that in all of these algorithmic tasks, the, property, the main property you're using is not real stability, but rather log concavity of the polynomial. Okay. So, uh, so, you, uh, so if you remember, if you have a hyperbolic polynomial or a real stable polynomial, 
there is a region above its roots. So, so here I'm, uh, I'm drawing the roots of a real stable polynomial. Uh, there, is a, there is a region above the largest roots. And uh, real stable polynomials are known to be basically a lock concave barrier function in this region. And this region is uh, known to be convex. Okay? Now, the polynomials that we care about have non-negative coefficients because they just, they're just encoding distributions, right? So the region above the roots would contain the entire positive orthant. Okay, so if g uh, mu is real stable, then uh, we know that g mu is log concave. Or the entire positive orthant. Okay? And I, I claim that in all of those uh, algorithmic uh, uh, primitives, uh, this is basically the main property you need okay? lock concavity. So, so, this suggests that maybe we should just largen uh, or enlarge our class of polynomials to just be the, the class of polynomials that are just lock concave over the entire positive orthand, and that's more or less what we are going to do. Okay? So, um, so this, uh, this observation that lock concavity is uh, all that you need uh, was perhaps first, uh, 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 so this observation was perhaps first in the work of Gurwitz, uh, who, who generalized uh, uh, his inequality regarding the coefficients of uh, real stable polynomials to polynomials which have uh, some sort of a lock concavity property. Okay. So, so he used this to, to derive uh, uh, approximation algorithms for mixed volumes and so on. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I might mention that uh, 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 in the second part. But uh, uh, let me not go into this work and rather give you two simpler but more illustrative uh, applications where lock concavity is enough. Okay. But so you, you now talk just about lock concavity. Yeah. So uh, you're correct. So. What you need is something called strong lock concavity. Uh, I'll get to that, but for now, uh, bear with me. Yeah. Just for illustration of it, because, uh, because especially in computer science community, people are all familiar with Brill-Minkowski. Yeah. Powerful tool. So Brill-Minkowski is lock concavity, nothing but lock bracket. So and sometimes you need more than Brill-Minkowski, and this is what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just for now, I'm not going to mention what strong lock concavity means, but I'll get back to it. I know. Yeah, lock concavity yeah. is Brill Minkowski for those. Yes. yes. Lock concavity in the yeah. So, so what uh, Leonid is saying is that uh, you have this Brill Minkowski inequality, which says that if you have uh, a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of uh, convex sets in some R to the d. Then this, this thing, so the uh, volume of Z1 times K1, Minkowski sum with Z2, K2, and uh, up to Zn times Kn. So first of all, this turns out to be a polynomial, and it turns out to be a log concave polynomial, and that's exactly Bruno Minkowski inequality. Uh, but what you need is something slightly stronger than this. Uh, again, I'll get back to what that stronger property is. Okay, so but, but for now, let me just mention two simple applications where all you need is just simple lock concavity, not strong lock concavity. Okay. So the first one is this optimization thing that, uh, that I talked about. So, so you have some distribution mu and you want to find its mode. Okay. And uh, for just the purposes of this illustration, let's say that your, uh, your distribution is supported on sets of size d. So your polynomial is d homogeneous. So, so that's maybe the case when you're talking about, let's say, KDPPs, okay? The terminal point processes are supported on subsets of K points. Okay. So why do you want to do this optimization? Uh, it's, it's very relevant in uh, machine learning applications, but maybe I can just uh, show you this picture and convince you. Uh, so here I'm trying to find uh, K points inside a square. On the left, I'm doing uniform sampling. On the right, I'm using the maximum of a KDPP when, uh, when basically the, the, the PST matrix is given by uh, an RBF kernel in this space. Okay. So as you can see on the right, the points are more spread out and more nice. Okay. So if you, if you want to do 
space exploration in machine learning, for example, this might be something that we want to do. But okay, so how do we do, how we do how do we do uh, optimization or approximate optimization using just a simple log concavity? Okay. So so the the main trick, which is uh, basically what uh, Nikolov did, is uh, you, uh, you do uh, what every computer scientist knows and loves, and you, you simply solve a relaxation. Okay. So the problem that you want to solve is to compute the maximum of your polynomial evaluated at integer points, which sum up to d. Okay. So if you, if you evaluate your polynomial at, uh, at the indicator vector of a d set, okay, you get exactly mu of that set. Right? So you, so when you want to talk about uh, relaxations, you simply drop the, the constraint that these should be integers, and you, you solve this optimization over uh, fractional points that sum up to d. Okay. So why can you solve this, uh, uh, this relaxation? It's convex. Well, convex. When, you, when you take its log, it becomes a concave program. Okay. So if your, if your polynomial has log concavity, then uh, maximizing this is simply the same as maximizing the log, which you can do because this is, it's, con it's concave. Okay? But now, uh, when, you, when you found uh, the point that maximizes this, uh, you can simply round to a solution by basically selecting a set with probability proportional to basically uh, the product of the zi's in s. Okay. So you, you find the maximum of that function. That gives you some uh, z1 through zn. Right. And now you, you do this uh, uh, probabilistic rounding, where you select a set uh, with probability proportional to the product of the zi's. Now, if, you, uh, if the probability was equal to this product, uh, then the expected value of basically mu of s would have been exactly the sum over all s, mu of s, uh, basically uh, z to the s, which is exactly your polynomial, right? Okay. So if, if there was no normalization constant, you would have, by this rounding procedure, you would have gotten an expectation the same as what you got from the relaxation, right? But there's, of course, a normalizing constant, and that's just the elementary symmetric polynomial on ZIs, okay? So you have to, basically, this probability is, uh, is this divided by uh, ED of you want to move ZN, okay? And, uh, this is exactly uh, uh, so over the over the uh, constraint set where uh, everything sums up to d. Uh, this is at most e to the d. Okay. So that's how you get an e to the d approximation, and that's uh, that's also tight. Okay. So that's basically what the algorithm of Nikolov does, and. Uh, so this is, a, this is a probabilistic rounding, but you can make it deterministic by the method of conditional expectations. Okay. So, so, ha so what I'm saying is that having that expectation correct uh, is not enough, because the probability that you, the set you round to uh, has a large value might be small, but you can, you can get rid of that problem. OK. Uh, so all right. So uh, for the second application, let me, let me talk about deterministic counting. Okay. So, so when you want to, uh, when you want to, uh, 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 when you want to count, uh, um, so so assume for now that uh, the distribution that you want to count or you want to compute its partition function is the uniform distribution on a subset of the hypercube. Okay. So. Um, So for, for this application, I'm assuming that mu is <coughs> uniform on some subset B of the hypercube. Okay. 
And I'm also further assuming that G mu is log concave. So when mu is uniform on the on the on some subset, uh, the partition function is the same as the entropy of the distribution, right? Uh, so uh, so basically the um, so the entropy of your distribution mu is going to be log of the support size, which is exactly log of the partition function. So if you want to count uh, how large B is, it's equivalent to computing the entropy, right? And we do have uh, inequalities that upper bound entropy. Uh, so no matter what distribution you have, uh, entropy has this property called subadditivity, which says that if you project your high dimensional distribution onto its marginal coordinates. So here I have, a, 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 I have an example of a distribution supported on the two dimensional hypercube. When you project it down onto the coordinates, you get Bernoulli, two Bernoulli random variables, uh, each of which you can just represent <coughs> using a number. Okay. So the entropy is always subadditive when you do this, this sort of projection. If mu1 through mu n are the marginals, uh, uh, they, the, sum of them, uh, uh, the sum of them, mar uh, the sum of their entropies upper bounds the entropy of your entire uh, distribution. So you can think of it uh, more or less as the fact that uh, an object basically lives in the product of its shadows. Okay. So it turns out that when, when this polynomial is log concave, you can prove that the, the upper bound you have over there uh, also becomes an approximate lower bound. Okay. And that's what I'm going to, uh, to uh, prove here. So, so the proof of this is very simple. It's just a simple application of the Jensen's inequality. Okay? So we have this G mu, which is um, So we have this G mu, which is uh, log concave. So you have this G mu, which is uh, log concave. And uh, what I'm going to do is to apply Jensen's inequality to its log. Okay. So Jensen's inequality, uh, all it says is that uh, log of G mu, then you evaluate it at a random point x. right? Uh, so when you take the expectation of it, uh, this is basically a lower bound on uh, log of uh, G mu when you evaluate it at the expected point. <coughs> right? So that's the sort of thing I'm going to, that's the sort of inequality I'm going to use. And what's a, what's a natural uh, uh, random point? So the, the, the main, nat so, so the only basically natural way to uh, to plug in an x here is to uh, choose a random set or a random uh, uh, point from the integer lattice according to mu and plug it in here, right? So choose, uh, so let's say uh, y is in 0, 1 to the n, and probability of y is given by mu. So the problem with uh, plugging in uh, this simple or natural choice y uh, as for, uh, for, for the random variable x here is that on the right hand side I get the expectation of y. Uh, but really what I care about is computing my polynomial at the uh, all ones point, not the, uh, not the expectation of y. Okay? So the expectation of y is uh, basically uh, a vector p1 through pn, where pi is the probability that i is in y, right? 
it's, it's some fractional uh, point uh, whose coordinates are between 0 and 1. And uh, the, the fractions basically determine these marginals that I've depicted over there. Okay. I care about evaluating my polynomial at the all ones point because that's my partition function, right? So there is a simple fix to this. You just uh, rescale each coordinate. Um, so you basically let x be y1 divided by p1 up to yn divided by pn. Okay. So once I rescale like this, the expectation of x is going to be the all ones point. So um, so when I plug in uh, uh, when I plug in x into the Jensen's inequality on the right hand side, I'm going to get log of my partition function, which is exactly the log of the support size. And on the left hand side, I'm going to get uh, the expectation of. So when I plug in uh, something which is a rescaled uh, indicator vector of a set into the polynomial G mu, every term in G mu disappears uh, or cancels out, except for the term corresponding to that particular set. Right? So G mu was, uh, was this polynomial, right? So G mu of Z1 through Zn was the sum over all t's mu of t z to the t. And uh, when you plug in zeros for, a z, uh, for one of, uh, some of these zi's, every set that doesn't contain those uh, disappears. So in the end, so there is only one set that's going to remain, and that's the set uh, <coughs> indicated by y. So you're going to get basically, um, uh, yeah. So you're going to get basically the product of uh, 1 over pi's, where uh, i is on the y, uh, coordinates of uh, y, which are 1. Okay. So uh, sorry, you have a log of this whole thing. Okay. So now uh, this is a log of a simple product. You can turn it into a sum and then uh, split the expectation. Uh, so what you're going to get in the end is the sum over all i, probability that y i is equal to 1, log of 1 over pi. Right? But this is simply the sum of pi log of 1 over pi. Okay. So, so from block concavity of g mu, uh, we've, got, we've gone to, an, to a lower bound for its partition, or the log of its partition function, which looks awfully like uh, the sum of the marginal entropies, right? In the sum of the marginal entropies, there is only one term which is missing here, okay? In the sum of the marginal entropies, you have this extra term. So what you can show is that uh, whenever the pi's sum up to d, this term also sums up to at most uh, d. So the term that you're missing from the sum of the marginal entropies is exactly at most the degree of g mu. Okay. So, so that's how you prove such an inequality. So this inequality you can basically interpret as saying that uh, when, you have a, uh, when you have a distribution whose polynomial is log concave, it's not too far from a product distribution. Because for product distributions, uh, 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 you, have an you have an equality between the two sides. And this is saying that that equality is almost satisfied. Okay. Is something like this true in the continuous case? Something like this is also true in the continuous case, yes. Uh, so I think uh, you, get the, you get exactly the dimension of the function here, more or less. Uh, OK, so, so what we've done is, uh, so far I've only told you an inequality, but we, what we care about is really counting. Uh, and, uh, and I haven't still given you an algorithm for counting, because uh, computing these marginals is just as hard as uh, uh, the, counting the counting problem itself. 
Uh, so it turns out that there are some tricks that you can do to, to get a counting algorithm out of this for, for, uh, for subsets of the hypercube whose polynomial is log concave. And uh, we're going to see later in this talk that matroids are a special case of this. So here's a quick refresher on matroids. Um, so a matroid is basically a family of uh, uh, sets or subsets of 1 through n. Uh, that we are going to call the independent sets. Uh, so it has to satisfy two properties. Uh, Dunbar's closure is the, is the fact that when you have an independent set, any subset of it is also independent. Uh, and the more important one is this exchange axiom, which says that if you have two independent sets, one is larger than the other one, there is always something from the larger set that you can add to the smaller one and still be independent. Okay. So I, I know that you've seen this uh, a little bit in the previous talks, but just a refresher. Um, so this second property implies that uh, when you look at maximal independent sets, they must all have the same size. That size is also called the rank of the matroid. So what we're going to prove is that when you have a matroid, when you look at these maximal independent sets, or the uniform distribution on these maximal independent sets, the corresponding polynomial is log concave. Okay. So let me just shut that down. So when you're looking at the basis of a matroid, its corresponding polynomial is going to be exactly this, the sum over all bases, the product of elements in the base. And uh, we are going to show that this is always log concave. So, so there are many examples of matroids. Uh, uh, maybe the one that you should have in mind is the case of a linear matroid. Uh, so you have vectors in some field, or in, uh, vectors in some vector space over some field, and then you call a subset of them independent if they are linearly independent. So matroids are basically an abstraction of this notion of linear independence. Uh, and uh, counting bases in matroids is an important problem. Uh, let, me, let me just... Uh, <laughs> give you a, a few examples. Uh, so counting bases of, a, of independent set or uh, counting bases or independent sets of matroids allows you to do things like uh, compute the probability of recovery in codes. Okay? So in coding theory, you have these, uh, these things called uh, error correcting codes, which are usually uh, the kernels of some matrix over some finite field. Okay? So you have, uh, you have a matrix, usually a wide matrix. And uh, you're looking at the kernel of it as, uh, as basically words in your code. Turns out that if, if uh, you send some word like this, which is in the kernel of this matrix, and if some of the bits get corrupted and get erased, uh, you can recover them exactly when the corresponding columns in this matrix are linearly independent. Okay. So, so being able to count bases or independent sets in matroids allows you to uh, compute the probability that you can recover uh, from erasures of this form. Uh, so you can also do graph reliability. So, so imagine that you have a graph uh, and uh, you're looking at subsets of exactly k edges which form a connected subgraph. These turn out to be bases of a matroid. Okay? So when k is equal to n minus 1, this is the usual graphic matroid that people uh, love. Uh, when k is bigger than n minus 1, this is basically the union of the graphic matroid and a uniform matroid. Okay. So being able to count the number of uh, bases in, in this matroid allows you to compute the probability uh, that when your edges fail with some probabilities, your graph remains connected. Okay. And then uh, let, me, let me skip this in the interest of time. There's, there's also these rigidity matroids. Uh, uh, which basically correspond to structures which are rigid. Uh, we can talk about it later if you're interested. So, so if we know that uh, there is a matroid whose polynomial is log concave, we know many instances of matroids where the polynomial is real stable, for example. Uh, so we already know some matroids where, 
where we know uh, the corresponding polynomial is log concave. How do we turn this inequality into a counting algorithm? So the way we are going to do that is uh, we don't know exactly what PIs are. So we can't just compute the sum of the marginal entropies and uh, use that as our approximation. But what we do know is that these PIs uh, fall into uh, a, a certain region of the space which we, uh, which we have access to algorithmically. So, so the, the vector of PIs is exactly the expectation of the indicator of a B, uh, where B is chosen, uh, where B is basically uh, uniformly random base. So now if you look at all of the indicator vectors of these bases, <coughs> they form some subset of the hypercube. So we know that uh, this vector of PIs is exactly the average of all of these vectors, right? Uh, which is going to be a point inside the convex hull of all of them. right? So we know some rough location for this vector P. And what you can do is, uh, uh, basically take the worst possible case for the upper bound and uh, find the maximum of the sum of the marginal entropies, uh, where basically P1 through Pn is in this rough set that we know. Okay. So this still gives you an upper bound because we took a pessimistic bound, right? Uh, but turns out that the same lower bound actually holds. Okay? So if, you, if, you, if uh, PIs are the maximizers of, uh, of that, uh, that program, so if PIs are the maximizers of that program, then you still have uh, uh, the, the corresponding lower bound inequality. So here is a proof of that. Um, so, uh, so I think, again, Shayan talked about this. When you have points inside a convex hull, uh, there is always some external field that you can apply to your distribution to, to get exactly those marginals. Okay? So what I mean by that is that there exists some set of uh, numbers, lambda 1 through lambda n, such that if you, uh, if you basically define or uh, so it's, so if you define a, an alternative distribution rather than the uniform distribution on bases, you, uh, you sample a set S uh, uh, with probability proportional to the product of these lambda i's. So if lambda i's are all one, this is again the uniform distribution on, uh, on the set of bases. Uh, but I'm allowing an external field and I'm allowing more, some elements to be more likely to, to be in the set than the others. So there exists a set of lambda i's such that when you sample your s according to this, the probability that i is in s is exactly pi for all i. Okay. So, so uh, this again corresponded to uh, to computing the capacity like uh, equality, uh, the capacity like quantities and stuff like that, but for now take it as given. Okay, so when you have a distribution like this, uh, the modified distribution, so so let's call this distribution new. So sample according to new. Where the probability of new of a set is given by that. Then the polynomial for nu is some simple modification of the polynomial for mu, right? Or this is proportional to d mu of uh, lambda 1 z1 up to lambda n zn, right? So uh, does everybody see this? Sample of bases, or you sample general sets? Uh, so I'm sampling bases for now. For for now, I'm just doing uh, uh, matroids. Uh, but you can do this for for more uh, general cases too. Okay. So uh, so uh, so the polynomial for nu is uh, basically a simple modification of the polynomial for mu, 
uh, I basically scale each coordinate by lambda i. And uh, the, the thing to observe here is that this sort of a transformation preserves log concavity. Okay. Any affine transformation on the inputs, uh, which preserves the, the positive orthant, preserves log concavity. Okay. So now, uh, by the log concavity of uh, uh, the polynomial for nu, I can again apply this inequality, this time to nu instead of mu, and get that the entropy for nu is bigger than the sum of the uh, entropies of new i's minus basically uh, d, where d is the size of my bases or the rank of the matrix. Okay. Now, the entropies of new are exactly uh, the entropies of pi's, because I chose my new to have exactly the marginals uh, which maximize uh, the, uh, the value over there. So did you want to multiply the mu of s up there by the lambdas, uh, the second line up there? Uh, the, the second, second line. line. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, sure. Be, uh, so, so because my, my distribution was uniform, uh, I dropped this term, but yeah. So OK, so just from the property that, the, that g mu is log concave, I concluded that g nu is also log concave. Now I applied my. Uh, entropy lower bound to nu, and I get uh, an entropy uh, lower bound for nu. Uh, uh, so, so I get this inequality. Uh, but the thing to observe here is that the entropy of mu is also an upper bound for the entropy of nu. Okay? That's because when you're talking about distributions over a set, the uniform distribution over that set is the one that maximizes the entropy. So nu is some crazy distribution. This one is the uniform distribution, so it has a higher entropy. So, so I again get the, exactly the same uh, lower bound as I wanted uh, for the entropy of nu, even though my marginals don't exactly correspond to the marginals of nu. Okay. So that's another application where uh, log concavity uh, uh, basically helps you in counting. Yeah, the cool thing, you don't need to compute those, the, those rates. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You also don't need to compute the lambda i's. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and that vector, so, so probability is this gradient? Uh, the gradient of what? Of your polynomial at 1, 1, 1? Uh, no, 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 it's uh, not. Gradient of the log. So, the gradient of the log uh, is, is, exact, is the exact marginals, right? Here, I'm just maximizing uh, the sum of. P1, Pn, those mm -hmm. exact marginals. It's the if, you, if you take the exact marginals, they are the gradient of the log, but these are not the exact marginals. All right. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, so, there has been a lot of talk about the log concavity of these polynomials for matroids, but I haven't told you why that, that is true. Uh, so, so, okay. So, uh, so there is, a, there is a basically fundamental reason that real stability wasn't able to capture uh, all matroids. And that's, uh, that's because when you're talking about strongly related distributions or real stable distributions, uh, they have this property called negative correlation. Okay. So, uh, so if, if you have, let's say, a matroid again, and you're looking at random bases of it, that means neg having negative correlation means that when you take two elements i and j, the probability that both of them are in your random base uh, is upper bounded by the product of the probability that in each individual one is. Right? So, so to appreciate what this means, when you have an independent distribution over, uh, over, uh, over things, you have equality here. This is saying that you are basically sub-independent. You have negative correlation. Okay? So every strong reality distribution has this property. And in fact, uh, it's a funny story that uh, at some point in the past, uh, people had conjectured that this also holds for all matroids. Okay. So Seymour and Welsh conjectured that all matroids or random bases of matroids have this property. Turns out that they don't. It took them a few years to find a counterexample because they didn't have uh, basically access to computer simulation, I, I assume. Uh, so nowadays, if you just generate a, a simple a linear matroid, you can, exactly, you can find counterexamples to this very easily. But, uh, but like I said, they, the polynomials for these matroids turn out to be uh, log concave. Uh, and uh, 
they also turn out to satisfy some other property which real stable polynomials uh, satisfy. So real stable polynomials have all of the three properties I'm, I've listed here, negative correlation, lock concavity, and being closed under directional derivatives. For matroids, experiments at least showed uh, that uh, when you take a bunch of directional derivatives, the end result is always going to be log concave. So not just like the polynomial that you start with, but when you take derivatives a few times, you're going to uh, still uh, come to a log concave polynomial. So that's, uh, that's what we are going to base our definition uh, uh, on. Uh, so the properties that empirically we observed uh, hold for uh, matroids, being log concave and being closed under directional derivatives. So, uh, so this is the this is the definition we are going to use for the for the second part of the lecture. Uh, you call some polynomial lock con completely lock concave if uh, after you take any number of directional derivatives of it in positive directions, uh, the end result is going to be lock concave. Okay. So I should mention that this is very much uh, inspired by a similar definition of Gorbitz. Uh, who basically uh, defined polynomials to be strongly log concave uh, when, uh, when the same thing holds when you're taking only partial derivatives. No, no, but they all had this definition as well. Right, right, yeah. So, so, right. so, so, okay, so let me, let me elaborate. Uh, so, uh, Gorbitz basically used the fact that this, uh, this volume polynomial which I erased, okay, so the, the thing that corresponded to the Minkowski uh, uh, the Minkowski sums of convex sets and the Brun Minkowski inequality. Uh, so, that thing, uh, he observed that it satisfies all of these inequalities. Okay? Uh, and then that was the, the thing that, uh, that he used to, to, uh, uh, to derive uh, inequalities on the coefficients of this polynomial. Okay? So, later on, we are going to see that this is actually not that much of a different definition. This is exactly equivalent to strong lock concavity. So in this definition, you can actually replace everything by partial derivatives. So how am I doing on time? Is it OK to go a few slides more? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, the exercise, so my worry is that the exercises uh, don't make much sense if I don't get to the next slide. <laughs> Uh, so perhaps uh, I can just use the, the may, maybe we can take a five minute break. I can go over this and then do the exercises at the beginning of the second lecture. All right. So that's, that's where we're going to pause. Tell the story. The story was that you had this, uh, you had this inequality and that concave. So we had this inequality for real stable polynomials, and then. Uh, <laughs> we were trying to find the application to make it accept. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then we thought, okay, what? what? That distributions have this log concavity properties, so we did some simulations. But now the whole thing is wrong than just theory. Yeah. Did you just say so it doesn't matter if you only take the direction, the reverse, the coordinate direction is the same as all parts? Yeah.